Okay, class, I need your attention. So any questions so far uh, with Banach contraction mapping theorem? I'll go over the theorem again. Uh, not the proof, but only the theorem, the statement of the theorem. So let's start with the one of the most powerful theorems in analysis, Banach contraction mapping theorem, okay. So the setting is X is closed, T is a map from X to X, it's a contraction and this implies that XK plus 1 equals T X K converges to X star which is fixed point of T. Okay, and if you want to look at, if you want to try and visualize it, here is how you should visualize it. So this is my set capital X. I start with any initial condition X naught, okay, and I apply T on this uh, on this particular uh, uh, well so so here is the first thing that i want to do so here is my x here is my y this is the distance between x and y i'm mapping this point x and y to tx and ty so i get this is my tx this is my Ty and this is the distance between Tx and Ty, okay. And the uh, and when I say that T is a contraction, what does it mean? It means that this distance is less than or equal to alpha multiplied by this distance, okay. So I want my norm of Tx minus Ty to be less than or equal to alpha norm of x minus y. Okay, so this is the setting. Okay, so if I pick two points and I apply t, the distance between the points uh, becomes smaller than the original distance. Okay, but it's not just smaller; it is smaller than some parameter multiplied by the original distance. So that's a contraction map, and I and this is my set X. I start with some x naught, and then I get t of x naught and then I get T square of X naught and so on, okay. These points are going to become closer and closer because of the contraction property of T, okay. And eventually it will converge to a point X star and this X star is the fixed point of T which means that if you map X star, so this would be your X star here in the set this is your x star and this doesn't change under the application of t okay so it remains where it where it was okay so even though x changed its position y changed its position under the influence of t x star did not change its position under the influence of t so that's the fixed point of t y star we proved it in the previous class okay so if you consider this sequence the sequence will always converge to x star Okay, and this, well, let's see. So what we proved was xk plus 1 equals txk, and what we proved was xk converges to x star, right? And you know that t is a continuous function. Why? Because it's a, it satisfies the contraction property. So it's Lipschitz continuous, therefore it's continuous. So I take the limit k going to infinity both the sides. So I have x star equals t of x star, okay? So it takes some time for you to first to understand the result, okay, what the implication of this result is. And then once you understand it, once you understand the mechanics of Banach contraction mapping theorem, you can apply it to many classes of problems. In fact, it's interesting, last, on, on Monday, 
My PhD student came to me and said, you know, this looks like a very, fairly difficult optimization problem. And I said, you know what, just apply Banach contraction mapping theorem, it will all work out. Okay, so I have to go and check with her whether it worked out or not. But really, Banach contraction mapping theorem is fairly, uh, even though the, the statement is so easy to understand, the implications are very, uh, are far reaching, okay? You can pick any optimization problem, and with very high probability, you can prove that the algorithm you come up with is going to converge to the optimal point using Banach contraction mapping theorem. So let's see uh, how you can prove some of the simple algorithms that we have already studied. We have seen that it converges to a stationary point. So we'll see how you can prove that it actually converges to that point uh, as a limit of uh, the sequence generated through this contraction map. So let's start with the steepest descent. Okay, and I want my, so what was the steepest descent? Xk plus one equals Xk minus alpha gradient of Fxk. Remember that in the steepest descent, I said that alpha can change with time. Okay, but in order to get a fixed map T, I cannot allow alpha to change at every time step. So I'm going to assume that alpha is fixed. Uh, it doesn't affect the, the uh, the actual algorithm. All we want to say is that this algorithm converges to a stationary point of f. So, so let me define t of x as x minus alpha gradient of f x. And let's also assume um, x is an R n. Okay, so t is a function from R n to R n. And I also want to assume that the second derivative of f is greater than or equal to 0. Okay? So it's a convex function. You can remove that assumption by just considering a neighborhood of x star, which, is, which would be the optimal solution of this original problem. Okay? So we want, what do we, so what is a fixed point of t? Okay, at what point, when is t of x star equals x star? This implies that gradient of f at x star has to be equal to zero, which is, as you can remember, is the optimal solution, right? So the fixed point of t is the same as the optimal solution to the original problem you started with. Okay, what do I want to prove? I want to prove that, you know what, this alpha is different from this alpha here. Okay, this is the contraction coefficient and that's the step size. Uh, let me, let me change this to, well, let me not change it to beta, but now I'll, I'll use beta to, to denote the contraction coefficient of this map T. So my question is how to prove that T is a contraction. How would I prove that T is a contraction? Any thoughts? Induction? Induction on what? T is a function, this is my function T. So let's let's take Tx minus Ty, okay? Tx minus Ty. What is this? X minus Y minus alpha gradient of Fx minus gradient of Fy. Can I simplify it further? How about we use uh, 
mean value theorem okay we can use mean value theorem here so what will I get x minus y minus alpha second derivative of some x tilde x minus y right this comes from mean value theorem. So what does mean value theorem say? What is mean value theorem? This is something you would have seen uh, let, let me write it in the scalar form gx minus gy is equal to g prime of x tilde x minus y okay this works in uh, in scalar setting okay when x and y is scalar that's the mean value theorem what is x tilde x tilde lies on the line segment between x and y okay and this works for any differentiable function g g prime is a uh, differentiate dg over dx okay so that's mean value theorem for vector setting mean value theorem is equal to this okay so gradient of f minus gradient of so gradient of f at x minus gradient of f at y is the second derivative of f multiplied by x minus y now x minus y is common so i can take that out and what i have is one or i minus alpha second derivative of x tilde some norm of this matrix multiplied by x minus y okay this is uh, how do you define a norm of a matrix so the norm of a matrix a is equal to max of norm of max of norm of ax over norm of x x is equal to 1 okay that's how you define the norm of a matrix and this this need not necessarily be the two norm which is the euclidean norm it can be any other norm p any p norm one norm infinity norm whatever norm is a favorite norm you can take it here so that defines the norm of the matrix A and that's the norm I'm using here, okay? By the way, it is important to note, uh, in general, T may be a contraction if you pick a specific norm and it may not be a contraction if you pick some other norm, okay, in general, okay, so you have to be careful about picking the norm, but of course in this class and most of the work that you will do, uh, as long as it's not final year PhD research, okay, so four years below four years of PhD research you will always be using Euclidean norm but just in case if you are in your fifth year of your PhD you might have to look at other norms and you have to be careful because your your T may be a contraction in a specific norm and may not be a contraction in some other norm okay all right so now what I have is Tx minus Ty is less than equal to some matrix norm identity minus alpha second derivative of f multiplied by norm of x minus y so all i need to prove all i need to prove i minus alpha second derivative of x tilde is less than equal to alpha for all x tilde in rn right so 
So what can we do now? How can we prove this result? So let's say uh, we assume that there is D1 less than or equal to less than or equal to D2 for all x tilde. Assume and I'm going to assume that D1 and D2 are both positive definite matrix. Okay. So D1 is a positive definite matrix. The second derivative of the function is, uh, so second derivative of function is larger than D1, which means that the difference of second derivative minus D1 is a positive definite matrix. And I'm going to assume that D2 minus the second derivative is also positive definite, no matter which x from Rn you pick, okay? So if this holds, if this condition holds, then we need to look at the spectral radius of i minus alpha d2 and rho i minus alpha d1, okay? We need to look at the spec, you know what spectral radius is? Rho of a, you know this is a review of linear algebra and calculus. Rho of a, what is the spectral radius? Rho of a is maximum of eigenvalues of a absolute value over all i. Okay, so that's my, that's rho of a, that's the spectral radius. So if you look at the complex plane, you draw all the eigenvalues of a, you have to find the circle that encompasses all these eigenvalues and this r is essentially the spectral radius of a okay so that's the geometric uh, picture for spectral radius why is it called a radius because it's the radius of the circle within which all the eigenvalues of a are contained okay so that's why it's called spectral radius so all we have to show is that the spectral radius of these two so pick alpha pick alpha such that the spectral radius of this is strictly less than 1. Okay, and you can always pick one such value of alpha. We can go deeper into this, but at this point of time, just take it, uh, uh, like take it as a fact that you can, given these two positive definite matrices, you can always pick a value of alpha so that the spectral radius of i minus alpha d2 is strictly less than 1 and i minus alpha d1 is strictly less than 1. And then what do we need to do? Uh, so once you have this result, then there is another result from, another result that you need which says that for every epsilon greater than 0, there exists a norm on Rn such that the matrix norm is less than or equal to the matrix norm induced by Rn. Remember, this is the Rn norm, okay? This is the norm on Rn that you choose. So that induces a matrix norm. So the matrix norm is less than or equal to rho of A plus epsilon. Okay, so this is, uh, so getting to this point is fairly simple, not a lot of work, just mean value theorem. Then you need to make some assumption, which is the second derivative has to be bounded from above and bounded from below. So this is a positive definite matrix, so it has to be bounded from above by some positive definite matrix and bounded from below by some other positive definite matrix. And these two matrices don't depend on x at all. They are independent of x. And then you have to pick a value of alpha such that these two spectral radiuses, red i, are actually less than one. And then you have to use this result. Where does this result come from? I think it's some, maybe in 510, in math 5101, which is, uh, no, not 5101. 
There is a course on linear analysis in finite dimension. Maybe in that course you will study this result. It's also given in Bertsecker's book, by the way. Uh, so for every epsilon greater than zero, you can pick a norm on Rn so that the so that the induced matrix norm is less than or equal to rho a plus epsilon. Okay, and you collect all these results together, then you know that this can be made less than, strictly less than alpha, for some alpha uh, less than one, where alpha is less than one. Okay, so it does require some work to prove that a map is contraction, but once you have that result in place, once you, once everything falls into the place, you have the global convergence of this algorithm to the unique fixed point, which is x star, at which the first derivative vanishes, okay, which is the optimal point because this function is convex by assumption. Right? So you get global convergence. That's very, that's very nice property to have for an algorithm. Um, so there were, we need to prove that the first step inside the norm that's the, that's the step size, and the other... That's the step size, yes. Yeah, that, that's the one that needs to be less. Oh, I, I'm sorry, this should be beta. Yeah. Remember I said that this alpha, the contraction coefficient is different from the alpha that I'm choosing there. So this is my step size, this is my contraction coefficient, and I want the contraction coefficient to be less than one. So by picking an appropriate norm here, over Rn, I can prove that this that this algorithm, which is the steepest descent algorithm, will converge no matter what your starting point is. Okay, it gives you global convergence. Now, if you say that well, your function is convex locally around the global minimum, then you can apply the same result only locally. So you define your set X as a subset of Rn. and x contains x star, okay? That is for non-convex, for non-convex function where you are, just, you are just interested in the local convergence, okay? So your function looks like this. You want to say that if you start from any point within this set, it's going to converge to the local minimum. Then you define your set x appropriately and you will get the result, okay? Any question? Yes? Uh, how do you use the final zero to prove the beta? Oh, this one? So my, my row of, I know that this, uh, okay, that's a good point. Let's, let's take a look at it. Should I delete this side? So I, I minus alpha D2 less than equal to I minus alpha you agree? Okay. So what this would give me is my spectral radius of I minus alpha second derivative second derivative will be less than equal to the min of rho of i minus alpha d1, i minus alpha d2, okay? So this is a positive definite matrix, sorry, this is a, so, you want to make sure that this has eigenvalues less than one, and this has eigenvalues less than one, and you know that this is sort of sandwiched in between these two matrices, symmetric matrices, so their eigenvalues will also be within those two radiuses, within the maximum of the two radiuses, okay? Otherwise, this inequality may not hold. 
Oh, yes. Sorry. Maximum. Well, yes. Well, well, this this is this a symmetric matrix? Yes, it is a symmetric matrix. Yeah. So then, yeah, yeah. Well, this will not be. Will this be equal? No, I don't think this will be equal here. Yes, yes. Uh, So the book book uses the theorem. Why does the book uses the theorem? I don't know. The matrix it should not. Yeah, it should not be. Yeah, this is this result holds for arbitrary matrix on or on uh, a arbitrary square matrices. So I don't know why we would use the spectral norm. Oh, I see. So the book is considering a more general iteration not necessarily a steepest descent, okay? So book's iteration is not steepest descent. Book's iteration is some other algorithm, okay? So now, getting back to this point, so we have this result, okay? This is strictly less than one, this is strictly less than one. So I can squeeze in an epsilon such that the spectral, no such that the norm of A is less than, strictly less than one, okay? So I can pick pick epsilon equals, let me call this gamma. Gamma is fine, yeah. Gamma, so pick epsilon equals one minus gamma by two. I know that this is strictly less than, strictly less than one. So I pick epsilon equals one minus gamma over two, and then I can plug in this result to get norm of A. There exists a norm such that norm of A minus, so norm of I minus alpha second derivative is less than equal to 1 minus gamma over 2. No. Uh, gamma plus 1 minus gamma over 2, which is equal to, what is this equal to? 1 plus gamma over 2. Okay, so I get the exact contraction coefficient by picking an appropriate norm of the matrix. Now, he's right to point out that since it's a symmetric matrix, this is a symmetric matrix. The norm is going to be the same as spectral radius. Uh, but, but I want to show you the more general method, okay? Because it's required for your homework, assignment five. Okay? Uh, so I wanted to show you the general method. But he's right to point out that since A is symmetric, this is going to be equal. Okay? Any question? So this is a general method to show that a map is contraction, especially if you're using it for optimization problem. Okay? Okay, contraction mapping theorem. So let's, remember we started with this iteration, so let's get back to that iterations, xk lambda k minus alpha, well, plus alpha. Well, let me write it. 
completely right so this is what i this is what i want i want to prove that this algorithm would converge to the optimal point and i also want to find conditions under which this algorithm is going to converge if you recall if i define my dk as in this fashion if my yeah if my define my dk at this as this uh, vector then it's a descent direction for half right this is something we proved in the was it the previous class yeah yes in the previous class this is what we showed right dk is a descent direction for that particular objective function but it was a descent direction under a special under a special assumption what was that assumption someone remembers what was the assumption anyone remembers what the assumption was no the second derivative of lagrangian with respect to x is strictly positive i mean it's a positive definite matrix that's what is needed for this uh, for this direction to be a descent direction and this was also a stronger condition this is a much stronger condition than what is required for second order sufficiency condition so how would i prove that this iterations would converge to some x star lambda star uh, which is a local minimum and lagrange multiplier pair okay so my goal is to prove you know so far if you think about this course so far we have put this proving business that the algorithm will converge to the optimal point you know this fact we have studied several algorithms okay we have studied maybe a uh, i don't know 20 different algorithms for different different cases but we have not spent a single minute on proving that the algorithm actually converges to the local minimum okay so this is the first time probably in this entire course when we are actually proving rigorously that the iterations that i'm coming up with they will converge to a point where we want it to converge okay so we want to prove that xk lambda k converges to x star lambda star so how should we go about proving it well banach contraction mapping theorem okay let's see what what we need to do uh, so my t of x let's do minus alpha okay so it looks very much like steepest descent right except that the matrix now i mean this is not a okay so let's look at the first derivative of this uh this function so what is the gradient with respect to both x and lambda of okay if you do the computation this is what you will find this is second derivative of l
then you have gradient of h x lambda l and then minus gradient of h transpose and 0. Gradient of h trans gradient of h with respect to x. Okay. What is the second derivative of l with respect to x and lambda? So let's look at that. So my l of x comma lambda is f x plus summation lambda i h i. So my gradient of x of L is gradient of f plus summation lambda i gradient of h i. Now I want to take the derivative with respect to lambdas, okay, because this is gradient of x and gradient of lambda. What is the derivative of f with respect to lambda? Okay, now I want to differentiate this expression with respect to lambda. What's the derivative of f with respect to lambda? Zero. Zero. Right, so I get gradient of x lambda of L is gradient of h. Okay, because this term will die out, all other hi's will die out except, so if you're derivative, if you're Finding the derivative with respect to lambda 1, only gradient of h1 would appear. If you're finding derivative with respect to lambda 2, only the gradient of h2 would appear. So overall, the second derivative of L with respect to x and lambda is equal to gradient of h. So I can replace this and I can write it as L gradient of h minus gradient of h transpose and then 0. And this is not a symmetric matrix, not a symmetric matrix, okay? Okay, and if you, well, the, so what do we, so, so in order to prove that this map is a contraction, what exactly do we need to prove? We need to prove that this matrix is, the spectral radius of the matrix is strictly less than one, okay? So T is a contraction if the row of gradient of t, which is a square matrix, is strictly less than 1. And this will happen when alpha is sufficiently small and the real part of the lambda i of uh, this matrix, I want to give it a name. Let me give it a name. Let me call this B. Okay. So real part of lambda I of B we want it to be strictly greater than 0. Yeah, so all I have to show is that the real part of the eigenvalues of B is strictly greater than zero. And in the book, it's proven, uh, let me write it as a proposition 
that if if the second derivative of L with respect to X is a positive definite matrix and gradient of H X star is full rank, then real part of lambda I B is strictly greater than zero. Okay, and I'm going to evaluate it at x star lambda star and this is all a local result if you start close enough to lambda star x star lambda star this condition holds therefore this condition holds therefore this is a contraction and therefore it will converge to x star lambda star okay that's the train of that's the train of thought Okay, so here is what we did. Somebody gave me this algorithm, okay? Somebody gave me this algorithm and I wanted to prove that this algorithm will converse to x star lambda star assuming that I start very close to x star lambda star, okay? I start within the basin of attraction of this particular algorithm. So in order to prove that this actually holds I have to prove, I have to come up with a map, okay? This map represents the algorithm. So T of X comma lambda. So, so this, this map actually represents the algorithm. So all I have to prove is this map is a contraction, okay? So this entire idea about proving that this algorithm converges boils down to proving that this map is a contraction sufficient in, in the close, in a neighborhood of X star lambda star. So I have to prove that. How do I go about doing it? Well, it turns out that all I need to prove is that the if I take the derivative, if I take the derivative at x star lambda star, the derivative of t, all I need to prove is that the spectral radius is less than 1. Okay, that's all I have to prove. The spectral radius is less than 1, and then we can apply the same technique that I discussed in the previous, uh, I mean, half an hour ago, we can use the same technique to prove that this is a contraction. So, so what happened? The question of proving the convergence of algorithm boiled down to proving that this condition holds. The spectral radius of the matrix is less than one. If you think a little bit more carefully, you will see that if alpha is sufficiently small, proving this boils down to proving that real value of lambda i of b is greater than zero, okay? So this, this would imply this, okay? And this would imply the contraction, the, the map t is a contraction and that would imply the convergence of algorithm, okay? So I need to prove this, okay? And then, in the book, if you read this proposition, the proposition actually proves that in fact this indeed holds true, okay? But when does it hold true? Your second derivative has to be positive, so it has to be a positive definite matrix, and this has to be full rank. If you look at it here, this has to be positive definite, and this has to be full rank, okay? At x star comma lambda star. And if that holds, your real part of the eigenvalues of B are strictly positive, which would imply that T, the spectral radius of T is strictly less than 1, which would imply that this T is a contraction map, which will imply that the algorithm you came up with converges to the optimal point. Yes. Why would this imply this? So let's look at that. So I'm looking only at the neighborhood of X star lambda star, okay? So 
gradient of t is equal to i minus alpha uh, alpha b right at x star lambda star right so what is the what is the uh, what is the eigen value of this matrix what are the eigen values of this matrix so in general okay in general so let's say lambda i is eigen value of a then c a plus k i will have eigen value c lambda i plus k okay in general why because if lambda is an eigen value look at the eigen vector vi multiply this by vi it will be equal to c lambda i plus k multiplied by vi okay so that's the idea so what is the eigen value of this it's equal to so the eigen value of i minus alpha b is equal to 1 minus alpha real part of lambda i b minus alpha and the complex part of lambda i b okay and so if this is positive you can make this number small okay by picking a value of alpha by picking an appropriate value of alpha you can make this small and then you can also make this small because alpha gets multiplied by the complex part of the thing okay so okay so that's so by picking an appropriate value of alpha the real part can be made small and the complex part can be made small okay which would imply that the spectral radius of t or the, the gradient of t will be strictly less than 1 okay but you have to figure out what value of alpha you want to choose okay there will be an interval you pick an alpha from that interval you're good okay so that's the idea yes b is not a symmetric matrix this is minus gradient of h and this is gradient of h yeah if this was if this was plus h then it would become a symmetric matrix okay but it's minus h here any other question so anyone knows why he asked why why he asked that this is a symmetric matrix or not can someone guess the answer why did he ask that question no one knows. Real, real, yes. So this will be only real. Okay. So there won't be any complex part. If it was, a, if B was a symmetric matrix, you will all only have the real part. There will be no complex part. Okay. Symmetric matrices only have real eigenvalues. But because B is not symmetric, we have to go through this. Uh, we have to go through this uh, this approach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then you have to prove this. Yeah. Okay. Any other question? <coughs> okay. This class is really getting serious. Okay. <laughs> now we are proving convergence of algorithms. We are using Banach contraction mapping. We are using everything we have studied in linear algebra and perhaps a little bit more about matrix norm and so on. You don't have to feel that this class is getting difficult okay the assignments are going to remain easy okay <laughs> only what you study in the class is going to get difficult from now onward uh, okay any any questions so far yeah yeah Correct. Correct. That's right. Correct. 
So in that case, is this will not hold true that? No, no, yes. Then it cannot be used. Yeah, you cannot use it. This is a very local result as far as optimization goes, especially if you're talking about nonlinear optimization of non-convex function. Okay, so the function looks something like this. So typically, if you're if you don't quite know what the function looks like, okay, which is the case, let's say if you're doing deep learning, your function would look something like this, okay? And let's say you started from here, you tend to converge here, right? But you don't know whether there is a point that is below this point or not. So what you do is you deflect the point, move here, and then you try to converge here, okay? Let's say you think that this is also not the smallest point, then you deflect the point further, and then you converse to the uh, minimum value. Okay, so you kind of keep deflecting each other. So you are, so within this region, you are in the basin of attraction and you will converse to this point. Okay, but you intentionally don't want to converse to this point because it may be a local minimum. So you deflect it and get it to some other basin where some other point will become the point of attraction. Okay, and so, so that's really what you are trying to do in order to. Uh, local convexity, yeah. Okay, so within this region, you can use Banach contraction mapping theorem. Okay, any other question? Okay, well, uh, we'll meet next week. Uh, I want to go over a few more uh, algorithms and then we'll talk about duality. Maybe we'll not talk about duality this week, or maybe we will, we'll see on Friday, okay? Um, duality is the next big thing in optimization, you know, it's really a very important concept, so we'll talk about it 